Well, welcome everyone. My name is Amy Sloan and I'm here with Kristen Rudd. And I'm so glad that you are here with us. We're going to be talking about Dante. We are expecting Wes Callahan soon, any minute. Uh, but I thought since everyone was waiting for one, we would go ahead and get started and uh, start our discussion about Dante. So I am going to kind of do a little tech stuff on the back end here, but I will let Kristen, if you would introduce yourself, tell us you know, who you are and kind of tell us a little bit about how you first got interested in Dante, what grabbed your imagination with yeah. the comedy. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, my, like Amy said, my name is Kristen Rudd. I live in North Carolina. I have two teenage children that I have homeschooled from kindergarten. My daughter is a senior and is doing dual enrollment at a couple local universities, including Thales College, which is a new college here in Raleigh. Uh, that's a classical, classical minded college. And then my son is 15. Uh, he homeschools and he's a ballet dancer. So our life revolves around taking him and picking him up from the ballet studio. Um, I've been homeschooling since kindergarten, found classical education around, I think, MJ's second grade year and kind of have been in that world ever since. Um, I teach online classes to high school students online. Uh, um, yeah, online classes are generally taught online uh, for, to mostly homeschooled kids. And I have never read Dante until about five years ago. It was not something I had ever been assigned. Uh, it had never come up in any of my classes. Uh, I had tested out of college literature, so I never read literature in college. I got an AP tested out of it. So I did not discover the comedy until 2016, when I was starting the apprenticeship with the Searcy Institute. And each year the apprentices read the Inferno their first year, Purgatorio their second year, and Paradiso their third year. And we read about a pace of a canto a week. That was the assigned pace. And that is a really difficult pace because by the time I would get around to reading my canto the next week, I'd forgotten everything that I had read. So I don't recommend a very pace with Dante because you just forget what you've done. And I hated it. I hated Inferno. I couldn't stand it. Uh, I think the pace probably had something to do with it. Yes, <laughs> I did not like Dante. And I was having a conversation um, with Missy Andrews of the Center for Lit and was telling her how much I did not like Dante and did not look forward to reading the rest of it. And she said, oh, but you have to read the whole thing to get it. I was like, really? I have to? She's like, yeah, like you're not going to see the beauty in it until you read the whole thing. And I'm really glad she said that because I think what happens a lot of times is that teachers and professors only assign Inferno probably because it's the easiest one to understand. But if you don't read the whole thing, you don't really see what he's doing. It's called the divine comedy for a reason. And you don't get that if you only read Inferno. And so I think we do harm to ourselves if we don't read the whole thing. So I read Purgatorio and I read Paradiso and then I went back and I reread Inferno. But something happened to me when I was reading Purgatorio. I found myself literally weeping as I read. And I realized that Misty was right. <laughs> you can't just read Inferno. You can't, you can't just leave yourself in hell. You have to continue to climb the mountain and ascend into the heavens. And the experience of Purgatorio really kind of started changing my heart toward Dante. I went from hating it to going, oh, it's okay. Okay, I like it. And then really realizing that I loved it. And I recognized that not liking Dante, the defect was not with Dante. The defect was with me. And I knew that this was something that was worth loving. And that if I didn't love it properly, then there was something about me that needed to change. So I continued reading it and I fell in love with it because I got to know it. I love to hear that story. And I think it's really encouraging just to hear that it's okay if your first experience with Dante or really any other work of literature, it's okay if it doesn't just magically like grab you right away and you don't understand it and love it right away. Sometimes right. these things take work and time. Uh, sometimes we need to grow and mature in order to be able to understand the work of literature. And so not to write something off like, oh, I didn't get it or I didn't like it that one time. So I'm never going to give it another shot or I'm never going to try to understand what's going on. Um, I think that's a really encouraging reminder, especially for, you know, I, I'm kind of the regular person over here, just, you know, not the Dante scholar. And, um, you know, we have, we have so many commitments and so many things on our time that we think, well, is it worth going back to that thing that was a challenge? Sometimes it really is. In fact, often it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll introduce myself. I'm still 
Oh, I see Mr. Callahan coming in. So I'm gonna let him into the room. And while he's joining us, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, my name is Amy. I'm a second generation homeschool mom of five. My youngest is six and my oldest is 16. And um, my first experience with Dante was in high school. It was an assigned uh, read for my homeschool high school. And I loved it. I was predisposed to love it because I read the Dorothy Sayers translation and I had a major literary crush on Lord Peter. And so I felt like if I could read Dorothy Sayers' translation, it was basically the same thing as, you know, reading the comedy with Lord Peter. So um, kind of a silly reason, but I, I went in, I think sometimes the attitude with which you go into reading a work of literature, like if you're like, oh, this is going to be terrible, it probably will be terrible. But if you go in prepared for an adventure, then a lot of times it finds you. So, Mr. Callahan, can you hear us? Not quite yet. Well, we will go on to the first question. Oh, I hear you. Hello. Yes, I think I can hear you. Can you hear me? I'm... Yes, I can. All right. I apologize for being late. I appear to be here now. <laughs> you are here, and we're ah. so glad you are. Yes. Oh, Hello. Well, I will let you introduce yourself. So I, I have a hard time calling you by your first name. I know like I'm a grown woman and I should be able to do this now, but uh, Mr. Callahan was one of my great books instructors. So much like Kristen is my teen's great books instructor. Mr. Callahan was mine back in the day, uh, wrote one of my very favorite notes that was read at my high school graduation that I think of often. And so I just think I'll always have to call you Mr. Callahan. <laughs> But can you introduce yourself to everyone and tell us a little bit about your experience with Dante? Uh, certainly, yeah. My name is Wes Callahan. I've been a, a teacher of the great books for, well, I don't know, over 30 years, 35 years, something like that. But yeah, Amy is one of my students. I, 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 want to need, I, I need to hear more about this note because you'll have to refresh my memory. I will. But one of the great books I've been teaching for all those years is, uh, is Dante. And while I certainly don't claim to be an expert, I've become very, fairly familiar with it. And uh, I love it. So uh, it's, uh, it's one of the great peaks in the mountain range of the Western, you know, the Western list of books, right? Um, so, yeah, uh, I've, been, uh, I've been teaching uh, online for, tw for 25 years. I taught uh, some Christian schools. Um, uh, I do a little bit of writing, live on a farm. Uh, happy to be here. So I have to tell a little story about Wes that I love. Um, something came up in my Facebook memories just a couple of days ago, and I, I tried to save the link, and I don't remember if I did. But some of us, and one of my, I had a thread on my Facebook wall where I was arguing about um, Aeneas Sedido, of course, and Wes jumps in, and we're, we're, having, we're conversing back and forth with several people, and at one point you said, I have to go the cows got out the fence. I'll be back later. <laughs> I just loved that. I just thought it was one of my favorite moments. Well, if, if it helps, the reason I was late today is uh, I was uh, greasing the tractor. <laughs> I, really was. I love it. The man of the liberal and the mechanical arts. I love it. That's right. Well, let's first kind of take a big picture. Like, let's go way back and just, Kristen, I'll let you start with this question and then, um, Mr. C, you can jump in, but can you give us a little bit of background? You know, who is Dante? When is he writing? Where was he? And why did he write the comedy? Yeah, sure. Um, so Dante, he's a medieval Italian. He was born in 1265 in Florence. Um, his family was noble, but they were poor. And I think there are two important things that we need to know about Dante, especially in reading the comedy. Um, he had two loves of his life. Uh, the first one was a woman named Beatrice, and the second was a city named Florence. So if you can understand these two loves, then you have a, a really good path for understanding some of what he's doing with the comedy and some of his other works as well. So I wanna start with Beatrice. So Beatrice is a girl that he met when he was about nine years old. They went to a May Day party at her family's home and he saw her and he just fell instantly head over heels for her. And like most typical nine-year-old boys, never spoke to her. <laughs> so he carried this love throughout his life for her. Uh, he would run into her occasionally, never speak to her. And then one day when they were about eight, he 
I just think it's so funny. I think, I think it's like so many typical teenage boys, you know, in their pursuit of a woman, they can't even speak to her because they're so overwhelmed by love. He was so secretive about his affections for her that he pretended to give affection toward other women. <laughs> so, he, so one after the other, he did this and word got back around to Beatrice about this. There was some gossip. He created some rumors and she snubbed him on the street one day. And like a good, you know, medieval Italian teenage boy, he went home and cried and wrote poetry. <laughs> so um, when he was 12, he was promised a marriage to another woman, a woman named Gemma Donati. And uh, he married her and I think, was it 1285? 1280. Yeah, he married her in 1285. Um, Beatrice was married to a banker in 1287. So he never married her. He never had a romantic relationship with her, um, but he had this kind of idealized view of her, this, this great love for her throughout his entire life. She died in 1290 when she was about 25 or 26 years old. And it was after that time, Dante really began writing and reading, kind of withdrawing and writing and reading more theological, philosophical works um, after the death of Beatrice. So Beatrice was his first love. And his second great love um, is the city of Florence. So that, at that time, Florence, there were two political factions that divided Florence. There were the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, and they were always at war with each other. And Dante even actually fought in a battle um, for the Guelphs against the Ghibellines. The uh, Guelphs ended up coming into power and defeating the Ghibellines, kind of driving their influence out of the city. And so, you know, like men often do, they immediately dissolved into infighting <laughs> and split into two factions. So they had the Black Guelphs and the White Guelphs. Um, the Guelphs as a whole uh, supported the papacy over the Holy Roman Emperor, whom the Ghibellines supported. So when the Guelphs won, they divided into infighting over how much they wanted the support of the papacy. The Black Guelphs were very much in favor of papal authority, and the White Guelphs wanted a little bit more freedom and independence from the papacy for Florence. Things came to a head. The Black Guelphs ended up winning, taking over Florence, killing all of their enemies, and Dante was banished. He was sentenced to exile. Uh, upon pain of death, should he ever return, he would have been burned at the stake. So he was told he could pay a fine to come back, but uh, for one reason, he didn't think he'd done anything wrong, so he didn't want to pay the fine. So I, I like that about him. And two, the Black Guelphs had confiscated all of his property, <laughs> and he had no means to pay it back. So he ended up being in exile for the rest of his life. Uh, he left behind his wife and children. Uh, they didn't come with him. His sons were later exiled as well. So he wrote most of his works in exile away from Florence, um, including the comedy. He wrote the Vita Nuova in uh, the 1290s. So he wrote that before his exile, but most of his major works were written after that. He then died in 1321. So he was in his mid fifties. So that's kind of a little background on who he is and what's important to him. And when I think about why he wrote the comedy, I think, why does anybody write anything? You know, Dante, he believed in God and he believed in beauty and he believed in harmony and he believed in justice for wrongdoings. And I think that all of those reasons inspired what he did with the comedy as a work. I would love to sit down and have coffee with him and ask him, okay, why, why'd you do this? But I think all of those things and all of the things that he'd experienced influenced why he wrote the comedy. So I would say that's why. Do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Callahan? That was a really nice summary. I like that. And I like the way that Kristen framed it as uh, his two great loves, because um, that's one really good way to look at uh, the idea of loves is a really good way to look at what's happening all the way through the through the comedy. Um, you know, everything that he sees that he encounters there uh, uh, is, is, is evidence of the of this of, of, of the fact that the, 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 the soul is immortal and it has a great destiny which hangs on everything you do at every moment. Um, and so the people he encounters and the conversations he has with the Virgil and with Beatrice and all these other people very often turn on uh, love being at the center of the human person, but loves can be perverted or distorted or defective or, um, you know, or, uh, or, or warped somehow. And so almost everything in the story has something to do. Uh, in fact, uh, I, could, I don't know if I could think of an exception. Let's just say everything in the story has something to do with love. Um, and the and the right or wrong ordering of loves, and he's very much a, um, uh, very much influenced by um, not solely but very much influenced by Thomas theology, and this is a big part of uh, Thomas Aquinas's theology, you know, that the, the the right ordering of loves, which goes back to Aristotle too, you know, uh, and other philosophers. But to, to see Dante as the poet of love, 
uh, is a uh, is is a really good good way to get a handle on him, and it, and it helps also to dispel that myth of Dante as the sourpuss because people who only ever read the Inferno, because the teachers think that'll be the interesting thing for the students, grilled popes and broiled bishops and so on. Uh, but if they read the whole thing, that everything from the beginning of the Inferno to the end of Paradise uh, is about uh, love and how it's used. Um, so yeah, I like that. My I love uh, that. my my students particularly are intrigued by the whole early romantic infatuation with Beatrice, as, as uh, Kristen described. Uh, you know, so when he, when, he, when he bumps into her, sees her on the street when she's 18, she says, oh, oh, hi, Dante. And of course, she has no idea that this young man over there has this just, you know, just massive, massive crutch on her. But he goes back to his guy friends. He's like, guys, guys, she said hi. Uh, and of course, never goes and talks to her. He goes and talks to his guy friends. So the students really like that when we play that, that sort of thing up. But it's useful to do because his love for Beatrice becomes part of his own sorting through uh, his loves that have become defective and distorted and, and so on, and that need to be reordered when he's, you know, uh, working his way on the journey to paradise. Well, Mr. C, can you talk to us a little bit about the comedy in particular and sort of its place in literature uh, for its contemporaries? How, how did they respond to it? And then sort of over time and, you know, how has yeah so how have people viewed it over time and is that different than it was originally yeah um yeah kristen you might have to help me out here um i i i'm, I'm not uh, um i'm not uh, real solid on the reception of him over time except that when we get up to time to i don't think i think he was i think he was already fairly uh, fairly famous by the time of his death wasn't he his poem was already becoming known um and that's why shortly after his death uh, Florence is fighting to get his body back after they've exiled him and so forth. And from then on for centuries, there's this, there's this tussle over who gets the relics of Dante. Um, uh, so he's, you know, he's, he's always on the radar screen, but then he has this kind of a, um, um, uh, a, a revival, I think a sort of a revival in the, in the, among the pre-Raphaelites and in the Victorians. And then, and then he's been massively popular in the 20th century. And I don't know how many translations have been made. So there's never been a time when he's, you know, been off the radar screen of the uh, um, of the reading public. I can imagine, like, can you imagine with all of the references he drops, reading it as, as a contemporary, <laughs> like, sitting around, you know, the campfire, like, he put that guy in hell, look what he did with that guy, you know, I, I thought, I can't imagine what that would be like. I know that um, his De Monarchia was banished by the Catholic Church as, um, I think, heretical in the 1500s, He's often considered to be like a precursor of the Renaissance, um, with a lot of the things that he did with his work, which is interesting because a lot of the Renaissance writers kind of discounted him as, you know, too archaic and, and too, you know, simple, you know, because since he wrote in the vernacular rather than Latin, which is a, a very conscious choice of his. Um, but, you know, since then, obviously, he's had much more notoriety. Yeah, uh, and, and I think um, part of the explanation for his popularity down, down through the centuries is the... Uh, um, uh, is the same as the explanation for his popularity in his own time, the, the quick popularity in his own time. He says, and I, I think it's it's in his letter to uh, Congrande della Scala, where he says that he's writing, he explains that he's writing um, in the vernacular so that uh, so that uh, everybody can read it. Uh, he says he, he says even women and princes, um, and and he says that because people who are normally not considered to be a, a literary people because they can't read Latin, which would be clerics and monks and so on. Uh, but, but still perfectly literate in the in the vernacular language, uh, he wants them to be part of his audience as well. Uh, so uh, it's not just the writes in the vernacular language, but the but the way he writes and the and the and the and, and the style and the illusions and the and the and the and the speed, the pace of it, and so on, are all cal calculated to bring in a wider audience than a bunch of you know monks sitting around in scriptoria. So does the impact he has on the Italian language kind of similar to the impact Chaucer had on English? Because English wasn't really, you know, a literary language. It wasn't really a written language until Chaucer. Is that similar to Dante or was it, was Italian used by other authors at the time? Well, the, it, it, it's Italy at the time was a bunch of Italian city-states. So it wasn't the Italy that we know today as a country. It wasn't a united country. And like any place where you're going to have a lot of city-states and independent, you know, areas, you're going to have differences in language. So when he wrote the comedy, he wrote it primarily in Tuscan, and that became the common Italian language. So we attribute the Italian language as we know it today to Dante's work and writing in the vernacular. And Chaucer even 
was influenced by Dante as well. So we call Chaucer the father of modern English. Dante is the father of modern Italian. And we could, you know, maybe say because of that, he could be the father of modern English too. <laughs> maybe we can give him a few more titles. Yeah, that's a really good parallel. The, the, the situation in England is almost exactly the way uh, uh, Christmas described the situation in Italy. Uh, England wasn't divided up into separate sovereign you know, kingdoms, but but there were widely separate separated uh, dialects. But Chaucer's London dialect becomes the dominant one. Otherwise, something like the you know the West Midlands dialect of Sir Gawain the Green Knight might have become dominant or something. But Chaucer was so popular that that, that his particular dialect took over. Okay, well, let's talk about why the comedy is worth reading and studying today. I mean, I think we're already sort of starting to get an idea of its importance, you know, historically. But the two of you in particular, the reason why I wanted to have you guys on is you've spent hundreds of hours, like, between the two of you reading and rereading and studying Dante and teaching it to others. Um, and, you know, we don't have time in our limited, finite lives to devote that kind of level of study to many things. So I kind of want to hear from you, one, why you feel like the comedy is worth that level of investment and that, you know, specifically for yourself or, or more broadly, and then kind of in a more broad sense, why should we study the comedy today as, you know, me, random homeschool mom, our teens, wherever you want to go with that. So Kristen, how about if you start? Well, it's beautiful. And that's a reason to read it. Like that's the first reason I would think, because it's a beautiful story and it's a beautiful writing. It's a beautiful piece of literature. You know, Jimmy Dugan in A League of Their Own says, you know, the hard is what makes it great. Dante's hard, it's difficult. I mean, I don't think if, I think if we say, oh no, it's easy, we do, we do our readers a disservice, but it is a difficult text, but it's worth reading. There's so much beauty that we can get out of it. Um, it's a beautiful picture of, of the afterlife. It's a beautiful picture of the heavens. Uh, the medieval concept of the cosmos is such a wonderful one. And for many people that reading the divine comedy is an introduction to that, to that vision. And it's one that's worth contemplating. Um, it's just uh, like we said a minute ago, you know, it's, it's pivotal. It's a foundational work, you know, it inspired Chaucer it inspired Milton it inspired Tennyson. Um, and we talked about Chaucer being the, the father of modern English. I mean, where would we be without Chaucer? You know, where would we be without Dante? So it's a pivotal work. It's an important one to read. Um, you know, we've talked about how he wrote in the vernacular. Um, he wrote he wrote it intending people to read it, intending the everyday person to read it. That was one of his intentions. And if we think that it's too high for us, then we're not we're not able to to go at it with that vision that he had for it even though it may be difficult, you know, a lot of the name dropping, I say hell is entirely populated with Italians, you know, um, and, you know, there, it's just, it's a beautiful piece of literature. It's a beautiful piece of work. There's always something to discover. Um, he wrote it in terza rima, which is a beautiful poetic form that he actually invented. And if you don't know what that is, terza rima is uh, line, um, stanzas of three lines where there, it's an interlocking rhyme scheme. So the first line is an A, the second line is a B, the third line is an A. Then the next tercet is a B, a C, and a B, and then a C, a D, and a C, and so on. Um, each line has 11 syllables. So in each tercet, you have 33 syllables. So numbers are very important to Dante, and it's really fun to kind of find those things in his writing and to pick apart those things. There's always something to discover. And um, I like to say that Dante is the gateway drug, which is the reason to read it. Um, I Reading Dante led me to read Ovid which I had never read, and I fell in love with Ovid. Um, I have read Ovid, I've read Cicero, uh, Stadius, Lucan, Augustine, Aquinas, Boethius, all because I read Dante. And I would never have even been introduced to some of those authors or never even heard of them had it not been for Dante. And there's more I'd like to explore because of it. So he's, he's the gateway drug. So if you read Dante, you're gonna be inspired to go read more really great works of literature as well. So for me, those are my reasons. It's a beautiful story, it's pivotal, it's important. It's endless, it's bottomless, and um, it's it's a drug. How about you, Mr. C? Uh, yeah, I think um, I, I like that. Both of us could come up with lots of reasons, but the two that always spring to mind, one for me is the, um, is the scope of it. Uh, it's hard to search with a greater scope. Uh, it's cosmic in scope, you know? I mean, he, he, he covers, you know, the bottom of hell to the top of paradise. He, in his, in, at least in his discussions, he covers everything from the beginning of creation to the end of time. Um, he's so, uh, he's so, um, um, you know, he, he's such a, it seems like such a polymath. He introduces 
uh, he, he, he appears to be well, well read, curious and studied in, in, in every subject that a Renaissance man would be learned in, you know, astronomy and philosophy and politics and theology and arithmetic and history. And, and so he, he, he brings it all in, he weaves it all in, but without looking like he's trying to drag learning into his poetry. It's natural to him. Um, so just the, you know, the, the scope of it is magnificent. I can't, I can't think of, uh, I, I can only think of one other work in Western literature that rivals it in scope, and that's Augustine's City of God. Um, and, and actually, that would that would bring me to my to my 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 other reason, um, the, the 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 fullness of it, um, what maybe the, the medievals would call the principle of plenitude. There there is um, um, <clears throat> not only is it, is it magnificent in scope, but it's full because of that learning we were just talking about. It's chock full of references and allusions to everything. And if you're not a learned person like the educated people of his day, who he seems to have expected to be in his audience, and he may have had higher expectations than reality really warranted, but um, he certainly, uh, his audience now certainly doesn't know what they knew back then. And so if you pick up your Dante and you read through it, and every time you come across an allusion to an event or a personage in history or some reference, you stopped and you went back and you studied that, just reading Dante and let's include Augustine's City of God, reading those two books could be the backbone for an entire liberal arts education because of their scope and because of their fullness. Uh, and Kristen was saying that uh, he's, a, he's a gateway drug because, uh, because every time you run across something, you go, oh man, I got to go look that up because I haven't read Ovid before. I better go read the Metamorphoses. So if you did that with both the City of God and with Dante's Divine Comedy, and I think that with the Divine Comedy, it's, it's even more this way than City of God, though I love that book. If every time you stopped and you looked up illusions, it would take you a long, long time to get through it, which, you know, you really should go through it quickly. So let's do this the second or third time through. It would take you a long time to get through it, but you would learn so much. You'd have an encyclopedic education. The rabbit trails are the point so often. <laughs> and I, I do want to say, like, I'm a homeschool mom. You know, I, I, I purposefully chose to dig into Dante for a reason. Um, Wes, you, you weren't quite here yet, but I'd said, you know, when I first read Inferno, I didn't like it. I hated it. And I was told, you know, you need to love this. And so I, I said, okay, then I'm going to do what it takes to love it. And now that I, now I do, but I, I want to go back to this concept that, you know, oh, well, we're just homeschool moms or, you know, we're just, you know, I don't know, pop fiction readers or whatever. I've given so many years on this earth and yes, we should read things we enjoy, but we should also read the best things we can. And Dante is one of the best works ever written in the world ever so far. And so it's worth reading. And even if we feel intimidated by it, oftentimes we feel like, well, we need experts. We need experts to hold our hands. And, you know, having guides is a great thing and it's a wonderful thing. But the lack of that doesn't mean you can't read Dante. You can. You can read Dante. Whoever is watching this, you can read Dante. You are a thinking, intelligent, beloved human being, and you can read Dante. You may not get it the first time, and that's okay. So what? Neither did I. <laughs> Nobody does. I mean, that's the kind of work that it is. But don't let the, you know, the bigness of it or the difficulty of it put you off. You are smart enough to read this. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a really Very good strongly point. about that. The, um, I think it's um, it's Lewis in uh, his essay on the reading of old books, where he says many people are put off, as Kristen was saying, are put off by the by the fact that this is a great author. Uh, he said, if, if they would only realize re the great author is great precisely because he is accessible in a way that all his commentators downstream are not. It's far easier to read Plato, he says, than any of his commentators, you know, who are full of this esoterrorism that daunts us all. Um, Dante, uh, uh, any a, a great uh, a, a great author like Dante is going to be accessible to a wide range of of, of abilities and, and and levels and so on, um, and offer uh, often the experts and the scholars. Um, or not. You can pick up Dante, and uh, if you have a decent translation and some fairly good annotations to help you over the rough spots, uh, no matter how much of a beginner you are, you're going to come away with, uh, with, uh, you know, with a full soul. I think a lot of times we put all this pressure, especially the first time we read something, like, well, I have to understand it fully this time, or I've wasted my time. And I think that's a really unhelpful way to approach um, 
great works of literature or anything that's really worth knowing and worth loving, you're not going to come in as a finite creature and just like, no matter how many other things you've read and just like, all right, I'm going to read Dante and I'm going to get it all this first time and I can move to the next thing. You know, the things that are really worth loving are worth putting the effort in. Um, and I love what you said too about don't worry so much about like the commentaries uh, sometimes can make things really complicated. I feel that way about Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare's writing for like the ordinary people who are just coming and want a good time. And if we keep that in mind, like these were intended for just ordinary, regular folk, you know, don't try to worry too much about how people have interpreted it the first time through, like just go in and, and listen. And you can hear these things that are talking about the same ideas, the same things we're facing in our modern you know, weak, what uh, questions about like humanity and our, the meaning of life and the meaning of love for Dante, you know, sometimes we make it almost too complicated because we're trying to be all um, fancy scholarly about it. And not that there isn't a place for scholarship. I'm not saying that, but um, it can sometimes stymie just, we aren't even willing to start. We're not even willing to try because it seems too big for us. We kind of, we, we kind of get this when it comes to something like the Bible. You know, we know we'll never get it all, but we read a little bit every day. You know, we have our devotions or we have, have you know, Bible reading, you know, programs or whatever. Um, and, you know, you can, uh, without a commentary, without without the original languages, with nothing but your Bible, you can open to start reading Genesis or the Psalms or Isaiah or, or the Gospel of Mark uh, and be struck by things that will be, that will be uh, in, enriching and, and, uh, and helpful and edifying. Um, and we don't go into it with the expectation, well, I'm going to get everything in the Bible the first time. We read it over and over and over again because, you know, you never can get everything in there. But the same is true of Homer and Virgil and Milton and Dante and all the great books. Yeah. Exactly. Further up and further in, it's bigger on the inside than the outside. Yeah, be okay with that ambiguity. Be okay with not understanding. You know, accept the fact that it's going to be confusing. And then, and these are the things that are worth reading again, right? These aren't things you should read once. <laughs> we should reread these. So, and I tell my students this, I'm like, you're not going to get it. Don't even worry about it. Like, we'll, we'll figure it out together, you know? And I think just knowing that creates, takes that barrier away, hopefully. Yes. And well, makes, let's, it, makes it more accessible. Sorry. Yeah, no, let's talk to those, those beginners. So let's imagine someone's watching right now and they've never read Dante before. So they're maybe looking at the size or they start reading it and they're like, there's so many illusions. Do I need to stop and figure all of these out? Like, you know, how, what are some things a person who's picking up Dante for the first time can keep in mind? Are there themes to be looking for? Any strategies so they don't get burned out in hell and never make it to paradise? How about, um, I mean, obviously one of the first questions people often ask is what translation should I use? You know, what's the best, what's the best translation, right? How do you answer that, Kristen? The one you'll read. I mean, I, I have multiple translations. Um, I think they all have their benefits. Um, I like Anthony Esselin's translation. And for one reason of something that you said to me a few years ago is that because he's a practicing devout Catholic, he understands something about Dante that some of the other translators don't get. People are huge fans of Dorothy Sayers. Um, I also like Alan Mandelbaum's translations because I find them very accessible. I find the notes in Esselin and Mandelbaum both very good. Um, sometimes they pick up on things the other one doesn't pick up on. And so I like, to, I like to often read at least with both of their notes. Some people like, you know, I mean, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow translated Dante, you know, I mean, that's kind of a fun translation, a little bit more difficult perhaps, but also a fun one. There are so many um, to be read, but I, I think the top three translations for me are going to be Esselin, Mandelbaum, and Sayers. Um, but I like to kind of, you know, dip into others to see the differences in language choices and things like that. But I think those are the, I think the people who maybe understand what he's doing the most and have the best notes and commentary. I would, I, I would have answered the question exactly the same way, uh, uh, Sayers, uh, Esselin, and Mandelbaum. Um, I think Mandelbaum was the first translation I ever read. Um, uh, Sayers is the first one I ever read uh, and got blown away by Dante. Um, and then Esselin was the first one I ever read uh, and got, you know, I don't know, blown back the other way. I don't know what the... Um, but uh, um, uh, every translation... Uh, and the, and again, the, 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 the parallel with the, with the Bible is a good one. Every translation is going to reveal something that another translation uh, didn't, unless you can learn, like Dorothy Sayers did, learn Italian so you can read, medieval Italian so you can read it in the original, which of course we all should do. Um, but unless you do <laughs> that, working on that. 
<laughs> but uh, reading different translations will reveal, uh, reading Longfellow's translation will, will reveal something about how he was seen in the 19th century and reading Dorothy Sayers will re reveal something about how uh, a brilliant medievalist like her sees it. And reading Eslin's will reveal something that nobody else will, will be good unless there's some other practicing Catholics who translate this. And on that point, by the way, Lewis and so I keep alluding to Lewis because I don't have an original thought in my head. Everything I learned from Lewis or, you know, other great people. Well, Lewis, he's kind of worth it. <laughs> what's that? He's kind of worth it. He is. He says um, uh, in, in the introduction to Paradise Lost, uh, he talks about how he, uh, like Milton, is actually a Christian. And he says most people, most readers of Milton now aren't Christian. from the outside won't and uh, uh, in the same way uh, a practicing catholic like dante is going to understand dante because he lives and breathes and, and and holds with his whole heart to what dante holds to uh, the rest of the um, you know uh, other other christians sh certainly share far more with dante than non-christians do uh, but someone who holds to the kind of christianity that dante does will give us a lot more illumination um, so that's that's one of the things I, I've learned things from Esalen that I never would have learned uh, from anyone else. And and Sayers close to it. She wasn't a Catholic, but she was definitely on the Catholic side. She was an Anglo-Catholic, um, and uh, so she sees some things and reveals some things that other others don't. But they reveal other things too. But um, but I, I, I deviated us from your original question. Your original question was not about translations, but about what again? So the beginner who's sort of opening Dante for the first time, some strategies, some themes to be looking for, encouragements to not get stuck in hell, but to make it all the way through. is meant to be read. It's not meant to be interrupted. That's the nature of it. You should read it, preferably out loud, <laughs> if you can. Absolutely. So reading it, reading it, I don't think, even if you don't get it, and Dante, one of the things I think that makes Dante very difficult is he does refer and allude to a lot of people. And sometimes he refers to people without ever naming them. And you have no idea whom he's talking about. But just read it. Just, you know, take that ambiguity as the man in black says, get used to disappointment. The Princess Bride's Man in Black, not Johnny Cash's, but get used to disappointment. Just be prepared to be confused. Read it through, feel the poetry, let it let it sit with you, and then, then go read the notes, and then come back to it and read it again. So th the truth is a canto only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to read. If you read it, I mean, 10 minutes if you read it straight through. This is not long. This does not take long. This is not a lot of time. And I, I saw I, you, Amy sent us some of the questions beforehand to kind of help us, you know, have a path for this. And I was like, okay, it's big. How big is it? So I grabbed my Esalen, which are my thickest Dantes, and I looked at how much just the comedy contained in each in each in each canticle. So they're each called a canticle. So Inferno and Pur Purgatory and Party. So we're each a canticle. Within this book. There's only so much that's actually Dante. It's about 300 and, I don't know, 61 pages of actual Dante text. There's notes and commentary and appendices comprising the rest of the book or composing the rest of the book. That said, within that, it's, um, I don't remember what the word for this is. It's not interlinear, but the, the Italian is on the left side and the English is on the right. So really you can divide that in half. So it's only about 150 pages. So it's really not that long. And so we're daunted by, you know, all of the extra, all the extra stuff in it, but it's really not that long and reading it doesn't take that long to do. To read it without commentary, without notes takes a canto a day, takes 10 to 15 minutes. So, you know, reading some notes going back and maybe 30 minutes, which yeah, sometimes that's hard to find, but it's, it's, I think that helps, you know, take away some of the, the pressure and the, the fear of it, that it's really, it's not that bad. <laughs> you could so read that awesome. while the, you wait for the pasta water to boil or something. Yeah. And the car line, you know, pick up, right. I mean, you can read a canto. So those are, those are excellent points. Um, uh, I, I, I heartily agree. And I would add, uh, I would add too, that um, sometimes people, a lot of people who are starting uh, just 
starting into the great books. If they've been reading the great books for some time, Dante is probably not going to be that that you know, much of an obstacle. But but Dante sometimes is uh, being picked up by someone who really doesn't have much experience with reading great books at all. And then is poetry. So you know, Krishna was talking about how much text there actually is in the, in the book. But then because it's poetry, it, the, the lines take up less of the page than a line of prose does. So there's even, even less there. But how do you read poetry? Um, and at the risk of offending people who, for whom this is perfectly obvious, a lot of people really don't get a, a very basic principle of reading poetry, which is that you don't deliberately try to read it as poetry. You read it according to the punctuation like you normally would read po prose and let the poet have done their work in, in, in helping you to feel, that, feel it as poetry. If you read it well, according to, the, according to the grammar and the syntax and the punctuation, you know, don't pause at the end of every line just because it's the end of a line. If there's no punctuation there, don't pause. Don't take a deep breath and destroy the meaning of the line. So if you read it naturally, the poetry will come through if the poet's done their job. And Dante has definitely done his job. So reading poetry is not all that difficult. You just read it naturally according to the punctuation. Let it do its, do its stuff. And people, people have said, I think it was Matthew Arnold in the 19th century who talked about uh, Homer. He said some of the great qualities of Homer was, was that he's plain, direct, noble, and rapid. That applies to Dante in spades. He's not a slow-moving guy. You start reading the poetry, just read it aloud, you know, read it naturally, and the story clips right along. But you know, before you know it, you're at the end of a canto, and you're ready for more. You're going, wait, wait, next, next. I think that's a really good tip, just to to not let the the lines throw us off. But to, if we're reading it out loud, in particular, we're going to get the flow of the language. And sometimes, and again, I, I I'm obsessed with Shakespeare, so I don't mean to keep alluding Shakespeare. But I think the same things happens with Shakespeare. If you're reading it out loud, even my younger kids can can pick up on what's being said if you just read it naturally, all in a chunk, and don't try to to force the poetry. I encourage reading aloud for everything you read and everything you write. I teach writing classes and I tell my students all the time, read your work aloud. And they're like, oh, oh I don't want to do, like, do it. It's not optional, read it aloud because you'll hear, you'll hear what works, you'll hear what doesn't. You'll Absolutely. hear what the author is doing a little bit better. Uh, I found, you know, Plato's dialogues, when I first read them, I just couldn't understand them at all. And I found that if I read them out loud, all of a sudden they were just so clear. It, it's the nature of what we're reading. You know, Shakespeare's plays are not meant to be read silently. That's not their nature. They're meant yeah. to be performed and watched. You know, poetry, you know, epic poetry was meant to be read aloud. I mean, Homer was an oral tradition at first, right? I mean, that's why they have all of these, you know, signals and signs to return to. Um, yeah. So as far as, you know, how, how to help, how to read it as a whole, I think I love what Wes said, read it aloud, do that. I think as far as things look, that we should look out for, I think each, each canticle offers something a little bit different that we should look out for. One thing to keep in mind is that this is an allegory and it's an allegory on multiple levels. So if we can remember that it's an allegory, that everything Dante's doing is allegorical, that's gonna help. But if we look at Inferno, which is, you know, a lot of people find it really difficult that, you know, I said earlier, you know, Dante really believed in justice for wrongdoing. You know, he watched what happened to his city of Florence. He watched what happened, you know, to his party, you know, to his factions, to the things that he believed in. And when you, you read Inferno, yeah, it's like, you know, He's just punishing all of the people he doesn't like, <laughs> which can be kind of fun. You know, teenage boys can get behind that for sure. But he cares about justice. He cares about wrongdoing and he cares about setting things right. And for him, Inferno is not a place of, of disorder like we think it might be. It is supremely ordered. It is supremely um, harmonized in its own way. Um, according to the way God set it out for Dante. And justice is a huge theme in Inferno. And I think looking at how do the punishments fit the crimes in Inferno is a great way to help, especially teenage students keep track or adults keep track. What is the punishment? How does it fit the crime? How does it fit the sin that's being punished? And when we look at purgatory, there's, there's a few themes to look out for. Uh, we shift from just punishment to purgation. So restoration, um, returning people back to right communion with God. How, how, does, how do the purgations in purgatory do that? It's a liberating canticle. Um, it's, it's, it's the punishments in Inferno, they don't end. The purgations do at some point. Like you move up, you know, you further up and further in, right? And then when you look at Inferno, there's so much animosity amongst all the people that exist there. And in Purgatorio, there's friendship. There's conviviality that we can see. And again, looking at how do the purgations fit the crime? How do the purgations fit the sin that's being atoned for? 
I think these are things to think about that can help us look for what's happening in, in those canticles. And Paradiso, oh, <laughs> it's so abstract. It's so much more philosophical. It's much more difficult. Um, I think I found, and I think my students have found, it's much more difficult. There's a lot they don't know, but it's also Dante, he's so brilliant. It's so highly structured. He walks us through the four classical virtues and then the three theological virtues in a very specific order. And I, if we can keep that order, keep track of that order, and then we can keep track of what he's doing. So keeping track of what's happening through each, each canticle is super helpful as far as themes to look out for. And his, his the biggest themes there are beauty. You know, Beatrice just grows more beautiful throughout the entire Paradiso. And beauty, order, the structure of the cosmos, the glory and the goodness of God. Like these are the themes to look out for there. Sometimes it's hard to keep, it's hard to keep track of those things, but it's useful to remember that Dante puts himself in the position of us. You know, he's confused at the beginning. He's learning as he goes. He's wandering around, you know, going, what? What's going on? And Virgil kind of rolls his eyes. Okay, let me explain it again. And Beatrice is the same thing. She kind of smacking him around. He's, you know, he's just as ignorant as we are. And uh, it's nice to have a narrator that we accompany who puts himself in the same position as us and not in some superior position. So um, uh, I, I agree. Uh, and, and Dante gives us all kinds, of, all kinds of clues for keeping track of those themes and watching as, as, as threads you know, progress and are elaborated. Uh, but when you don't get them, again, as Kristen said earlier, you know, be, be, be comfortable with ambiguity because Dante sure is. Well, I don't know if he's comfortable with it, but he's comfortable <laughs> with his discomfort. Or at least he wants us to be comfortable with his discomfort. That didn't make any sense at all, did it? No, that totally did, actually. <laughs> um, I like your question, Amy. We said, how do we avoid getting burned out in hell? And I love this because the only way out is through. You have to go through. I think for hell, for Inferno, one of the ways that I keep from, I guess, feeling despair or like it's too much, it's too dark. Um, Charles Williams writes in The Figure of Beatrice that hell, Dante's hell is horrible and it's meant to be. That's the point. It's hell. It's supposed to be horrific. One of the things I focus on and I have my students focus on in reading Inferno is the relationship between Dante and Virgil, his guide. And it becomes so hopeful because they're going, they're traveling through hell. And there's this moment in Canto 8 where they're in the mid, they're at the midway point. They're crossing the river Styx. They've just arrived on the shore of the city of Dis. And there are thousands of demons on the ramparts of the walls of the city. And they're looking down and they recognize that Dante is alive, that he's not dead. He's not a shade. And they start taunting him. You should go back. You should, Virgil, you should leave him. You should send this guy back and see if he makes it. And Dante has a complete panic attack and he freaks out. And he gets so afraid. He goes, we should turn back. We should go back. Don't leave me. And this is one of my favorite. I'm going to read this because this is one of my favorite lines in the entire comedy. Virgil says, this is the Esalen translation. Have no fear. No one can take from us our passage on, granted by one so great. Wait for me here and feed upon good hope to fortify your soul in its fatigue. I will not leave you in the lower world. How do you not love that? <laughs> I think one of the things we can learn from Inferno is, you know, often we feel like we're going through hell. All right, we're in pandemic, right? Like we're all going through hell, but what should we do? We should feed upon good hope and understand that we will not be left in the lower world. We're not going to be left behind. It's beautiful that when you find yourself in hell, you have to keep going. Don't look back. Don't turn back. The only way out is through. Thank you for sharing that with us. I think that in a nutshell gives that hope to the reader that it's worth persevering. Uh, Mr. Callahan, do you have a, a passage of Dante that is a favorite of yours that you could share with us? Well, the, at the beginning of the, of the paradise, the Paradiso, um, he, um, <clears throat> uh, he's, uh, when he recovers from his shock of figuring out what's happening to him as he's rocketing up the top of Mount Purgatory, um, he stops and he turns and he addresses uh, and he uh, addresses the reader. Um, and and um, <clears throat> I, I had this on my screen, but my browser just crashed. It's easy enough, however, to summarize it because he tells the he he, he tells the, he tells the reader he says you who have and now I'm 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 largely paraphrasing Sarah's translation, but 
uh, it says, you who have followed in light cockle shells, turn back now for this. But those of you who want the bread of angels, you know, follow on. So he makes a distinction between, he turns and he looks at the reader and he, and he makes a distinction. He says, if you're following for the sound of the poetry, just the beauty, just the superficial aspects of it, um, because your literature teacher you made, you, made you read this, because some friend said it's a great book. If you're just reading it for the, for the superficial aspects, you're in danger of actual destruction. The more you read truths like Dante, Dante takes all of this stuff infinitely seriously. This whole story is about the is about the eternal uh, destiny of the soul, and so um, Dante is telling all these truths. And the more we expose ourselves to truths and do nothing with them, the more we're hardening our hearts, scarring them, practicing not being sensitive and 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 repenting when today is the day of salvation. Now, if you hear this, you don't harden your hearts. The reason that warning is given to scripture is because if I if I hear it, it's easier to harden my heart tomorrow. I've already practiced the concrete set a little bit. And Dante knows that. He says, if you're just if you're just reading for this stuff, you're gonna not just not get anything out of it. You are actually uh, uh, in danger of destruction because I'm trying to give you all this stuff and you're hardening your heart against it. You're not receiving it and putting it into practice. But he says, if you if you seek the bread of angels, then you know then follow on. So this is real. Uh, this is real uh, medicine for immortality. This is real food for the soul, eternal food for the soul, Dante says. So um, he, he, he actually says, I don't want people who are just reading this because it's a beautiful book. I want people who will take me and the truths I'm, 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 I'm telling seriously. So then, then, you know, this is at the beginning of the paradise. And a lot of people have trouble with the, with the paradiso. They have, because... Um, I mean, the, uh, you know, who wouldn't love the Inferno? There's all this, all this cool act, action, this, you know, it's like semi-horror movie. And then uh, the Purgatory is very human, very relatable, but Paradiso just seems beyond us. And it, and, and it, it could only be that way because, um, uh, because something of the nature of hell we can understand. Retribu retribution, justice, we deeply desire that, although we deserve it ourselves. Um, you know, punishment, gruesome, there are all kinds of things that, that appeal to us. And there are all kinds of things about purgatory that appeal to us. But almost nothing about paradise is relatable to us in our state, this side of paradise. It's, it's transcendent. How can you describe what paradise would really be like to be eternally in the presence of the God who made me and loves me and has called me to himself and is embracing me? How can you describe that? I mean, some authors... Uh, you know, Lewis here and there, and maybe, you know, I don't know, there's some authors who give us glimpses, we think, but Dante is trying to give a picture of a, of a region and a journey through a region that's almost entirely unrelatable. So um, I think what happens, and I, I, I ran across an essay by someone, I think it was in Slate Magazine of all places, uh, ten, 10 years ago or so, where they, they uh, I can't remember the rest of the article, but they said something like this. They said, uh, we read Parad the Paradiso, and it's beyond us, and we can't understand it because it is. It sits in judgment on us. We have a kind of we have a way of kind of judging hell and purgatory, but we have no way of it, so it judges us. And it seems to me a, a healthy thing to keep reading as Christians said, keep reading through the paradiso and keep reading through the inferno, um, knowing that you're under judgment by a region that I may or may not reach, that I may or may not deserve, probably not. Uh, that looks at me in entire love, but says everything depends on which way your heart leans as to where you're going to wind up here. Uh, it's you know it's 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 uh, it's it's hard to it's hard to keep reading through the Paradiso when you finally realize it's sitting in judgment on me, not me the reader sitting in judgment on it. But that's a really good thing. That's a really really healthy thing, and it could be a really humbling thing, you know, if we if we kind of embrace it and uh, embrace it. All that having been said, I think Kristen's advice is good. You just keep reading. The only way. <laughs> we never get out of Paradiso if you're one sin, but the only way through the canticle uh, is, is, is all the way through. To stop, to stop partway through the Paradiso would be like stopping at St. Peter's Gate on the Purgatorio, you know, where the angel says, don't look back. Once you come through here, don't ever look back. You know, like Lot's wife. To, to, to look back once you're partway through, the, through Paradiso is to, is to, is to risk, risk destruction. That's... Uh, but I think anyway. So keep reading. Just read it. Just read it. Pick up the book and read it. And don't stop. And when you get to the end of the Paradiso, go back to the beginning of the Inferno and do it again. 
seems like good advice and what we will be doing this fall. Um, I'm going to open up and see if anyone has any questions, but as I check to see, um, do you guys have anything that I haven't asked or that you haven't said yet that you would like to, to say about Dante? I think I've covered, covered a lot. Yes. I think this was a great, I'm, I'm really inspired to, to get back into Dante. So like I said, it's been since high school that I've read all the way through. Since then I've read bits and pieces um, alongside my kids, but I have not read the entirety in a couple decades. So I'm looking forward to joining you on that adventure. So that being said, while I'm kind of popping over to Facebook as well to see if anyone has any questions who's here live, um, can you both tell us where people can find you around the internet and how you can help them learn more about Dante? Kristen, why don't you go first? Yeah. Um, I, since I offer online classes, they're available through my website, kristenrudd.com. You can find classes and registration on there. Also, uh, links to all the things I've written are up there as well. Uh, on Facebook, I have three reading groups that you can join. Um, they all have a hashtag at the beginning, 100 Days of Dante with a hashtag. Um, you should be able to search for that and find the Facebook group that way. Um, I started a second group called Everyday Ovid. <laughs> After I read Dante, I started an Ovid group, so hashtag Everyday Ovid. And we read the Iliad, Odyssey, and Aeneid, so we have hashtag This Is Epic. So there are three Facebook groups all designed to help people read classics in community uh, we are your Virgil. We are here to help get you through them uh, to demystify the process. Not too much, just a little bit, because you need some mystery to have some fun. Um, but we, Dante Group will be starting up again on September 1st. We've got a reading plan listed on that website, on the Facebook group. And uh, we have, uh, it's not live yet, but I'll go ahead and announce it. So once we get things up, but we do have 100daysofdante.org that we will transfer some of the same information and um guides over to that website as well. well. That's exciting. I have the Facebook group linked up um, over where this is on Facebook now, and I'll have the replay up on YouTube, and I'll, I'll have that link, and I'll include the new website as well. How about you, Mr. Callahan? Um, I, I, I have to say, you really could do no better than signing up with Kristen's stuff. Kristen, I, I, I've sat in on, on uh, Kristen's Dante class at least one, one session, and I know some of the students there, and I think she does a tremendous job. So definitely check out the stuff that she does. And the 100 Days of Dante, the, the, the Facebook group. Um, it's, uh, the, it's the original 100 Days of Dante Facebook group, and it's been going for a number of years. And, and as far as I know, it'll continue to go. And they have really good discussions on there, and she provides tremendous leadership. So that's a good way to go, uh, go for someone who wants to learn more about Dante. Join the group, start reading, ask questions, make comments. Um, that's a really good online presence. Um, uh, if, if someone wants to contact me, I, I, I'll, I'll, be teaching, uh, I'll be teaching a course on Dante this fall, um, also through, um, uh, through Circe, the Circe Atrium program, uh, and it's uh, just about to start in a week or two, uh, but it's not too late to sign up if somebody wanted to do that. Um, I also do some teaching through uh, Kepler, as does Kristen, Kepler Education. There we go, there's the official mug. Yeah, so I can be contacted through uh, Kepler as well. Um, Kepler.education, not edu, Kepler.education is their, is their domain, their website. So you can go to Kepler.education um, and you can, you can contact uh, um, uh, me through Kepler as well. Um, but I, you know, I, um, uh, I have to say, I kind of feel, I, I, I kind of, I kind of feel like uh, Kristen is just sort of taking over and she picked up the mantle for my Dante, my Dante <laughs> Does a tremendous job. The one class I sat in on, I was amazed at the stuff she was uh, she was pulling out and and uh, leading the students into. So I recommend it. Oh, I you. sat in on that. I sat in on that class. I was on the futon off screen, so I didn't embarrass my my teenager. But it was a good one. Well, well I will be taking Wes's atrium class as well because I just need more opportunities to read and discuss Dante with Wes. So I'll be taking that class. I'm looking forward to it. We just can't get enough of each other. That's true. That's true. 
And I think, you know, all great books are better in community. You know, we, as we read and we discuss together, we're not designed to, to do this alone. And so I really right. appreciate both of you being willing to come and share your thoughts on Dante. I am so excited for, I hope this inspires a bunch of people to, to pick up Dante and, and read him for the first time, perhaps, or to revisit if maybe like you, Kristen, the first time through, they weren't so excited. Um, my, my website is humilityanddoxology.com, and I have a podcast, Homeschool Conversations with Humility and Doxology, which you can find in all your favorite podcast apps. If you want to hear more from Kristen and Mr. Callahan, they have both been previous guests on there talking all things great books and humility and education, so highly recommend those. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to see if I can hit all the right buttons to get us off Facebook. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I, this has been really fun. Yeah, it's a delight. <laughs>